Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Giggle Node.js uh, Summit. We're happy to see you, everyone here. We're starting now the third block on the junior track, and now we are starting our conversation with uh, Karin Angel, uh, who is an experienced software engineer with expertise in building high-scale, highly available, and performant systems in microservices architecture in Node.js. We're starting now very soon. Uh, Karin, welcome Hi. to the stage. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, very well. I'm quite uh, busy, as you can see, all the day here. <laughs> Is it your first conference? Um, online? Actually, actually, online? Um, no, I actually had one um, at the beginning of mm -hmm. May. At the beginning of May, uh, JS uh, VidCon. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had uh, an online uh, session, but it was pre-recorded. This is the first one uh, live. Yay. Yeah. So I hope it goes well. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very excited. Hope that uh, everyone is uh, OK and is having a good time uh, learning mm -hmm. experience. Yeah, I hope yes. that too. Actually, you're just, I, I was a little bit surprised. Everyone now, um, starting from the from the first speaker, everyone has just the first online conference. And it looks like we are really one of the first ones there. Uh, I would like to mention that, yeah, it, it's quite hard to go live immediately. It, it, it requires some experience and maybe some technical things. Uh, sometimes we'll get some small issues that we are just resolving on the go. However, it, it's really good to see how uh, it, to see the attitude of people who are just looking at it and, and they, they just give us small excuses in order to get big benefits. Tell us a few words about yourself. Where are you from? Um, so basically, I am uh, in Israel, uh, mm -hmm. next to really next to Tel Aviv. I am um, in the five uh, in the past five years. I am a Node.js developer, uh, okay. and I have a, um, a large experience of coding uh, before. Uh, I'm working at a really cool startup uh, called Autofleet uh, okay. in the automotive uh, industry. Mm, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited about uh, testing. Uh, and making sure that my code actually works and that I'm doing <laughs> my work properly. <laughs> Sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Um, yeah, you can share your screen now. I'm ah, going to cool. enable it, and now I'm passing it to you. Uh, at, the, at the last five minutes, I'll connect back just for a few seconds. I'll show that five minutes are left, then two minutes, then one minute. Uh, then there will be a small break, then we'll enable the next speakers. And at the end of that, we're going to have a Q&A session when you all will be connected here. Cool. So stay tuned. And yeah, go ahead. You can start. Um, OK, so I hope everyone can see my presentation. Um, so Hello to everyone again. I am uh, Karin Angel, and I'm going to talk to you today about how to test properly your um, microservices architecture system uh, in Node.js. So first of all, a few words of who am I? So as I said uh, before, I'm uh, a Node.js developer in the last five years. I currently work at Autofleet, which is a really cool startup uh, in the automotive um, industry. Uh, on my spare time, I really like to take care of my fish. I like to pickle things, and I really, really like uh, to paint. So the agenda for today's talk is going to be, uh, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit um, about what microservices architecture is. A really short overview. Um, we're going to understand why is it difficult um, and what parts are difficult in testing uh, your system that is written on top of microservices architecture. 
Um, we're going to understand the role of unit tests and API tests and understand when do we want to use each and every one of them. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of integration tests. And at the end, I'm going to give you a tip of how uh, to post-production test your environment. So let's dig in. What is uh, microservices architecture? So microservices architecture is a development technique that allows you to create a lot of services, a lot of servers, um, that allows you to make them loosely coupled. Uh, they allow you to, to have them fine-grained. Um, they are organized around some kind of a uh, business uh, capabilities. Um, they have clear interfaces so they can communicate with each other. They have um, they communicate over uh, technology agnostic protocols. Um, for each and every microservice, you can use different language, different uh, databases, different hardware. So they're very flexible. Um, they are independently deployable. Each microservice it can be deployed on its own in a different time. Um, and they're autonomously developed. Uh, you can develop each microservice uh, on its own, uh, and you just need to integrate it with other microservices for some kind of a business logic or a business flow to work. Um, so microservices architecture looks something like this. You have some kind of a user interface that talks to an API gateway. Uh, in its turn, the API gateway sends the requests to um, the proper microservice. Uh, microservices can also talk to each other uh, to perform some kind of uh, business logic. Uh, each microservice has its own uh, resources such as database or uh, some kind of a computing um, um, uh, CPU, uh, memory, etc. cetera. Um, and the benefits that, the, that it gives us this kind of, an the, this kind of architecture uh, is the fact that, that we can build our system in a modular way. Uh, we can decide whether we want the uh, this specific uh, service or maybe in the future we don't want it anymore. Um, it allows us an easy integration with legacy systems. You can think of some kind of a monolith that you have and now you want to add some new component to it. So you can write the new component as an uh, independent service, a service or an independent server and it can talk to that monolith and in a magical way you have also have an uh, um, uh, microservices architecture or you can have some kind of a benefit out of it um, it allows you to distribute your development and develop parallelly um, and it makes scale, scalability issues really easy because you can scale each microservice on its own. Um, the concerns that we have uh, when we're dealing with microservices architecture is that each service needs its own individualized monitoring. Um, it has higher costs in terms of network latency and message processing time. Uh, in terms of communicating between uh, service and service. Um, the number of services and their processes can grow exponentially. Um, and it is more complicated to test and to deploy. And this is what we're going to talk about today. The, complicating, the complicated part of testing of microservices architecture. So how does a developer's life look like, uh, roughly? So at the beginning of the day, we start off our work on uh, one, two, or microservices. Uh, we spend most of our day coding, and then at the end of the day, or in the middle of the day, uh, depending 
code on how fast you are. Um, we're pushing our code to the master, to production, and we're thinking, hey, our code is really, really great. But not so fast, right? Uh, we need to make sure that we've covered all of our all, uh, all of our edge cases. Uh, we want to make sure that the piece of code that we wrote uh, works independently and works together with and integrates good in a, in a good way with other services. Uh, and we want to push uh, code to production that works but doesn't break older functionality. And it's a hard life for a single developer as it is. So imagine how it is to work in a team or a group of teams uh, that each team is uh, entitled on a different microservice and you need to integrate between teams of developers. Um, I really hope this video would work. Um, here we have an example of uh, people that are uh, um testing uh their product so let's watch the video it's a really short one I'm sorry to interrupt you, Karin. I would suggest to try to restart the video as it's quite well, good, but the thing is that we cannot hear anything. Oh, so um, so let's uh, so let's uh, yeah. So uh, I'll skip I'll skip the video. Um, basically, what the video shows is a bunch of people that um, are doing uh, some kind of um, testing of their app and. Um, basically, what they what they show is that uh, their test has failed. Basically, it was successful because they understood that uh, they have some kind of a bug in their code so they cannot release it to the clients and if they would have released it to the clients before they tested it um, pictures from uh, one cell phone would have gone to the other cell phone um, and it would have been a disaster so you can say the test has failed i would say the the test has has been successful because it revealed a bug so that's the approach uh, I, take, I take on tests. So in the rest of the talk, I want to consider some kind of food delivery app. Um, it is developed on top of microservices architecture. It has a lot of microservices. It has the user microservice that is uh, taking care of the logic of a user. It has the cart microservice that is entitled on the um uh logic of a cart um and a lot of other microservices and we were hired uh to the scooter ms to the scooter microservice team and this is the team we're gonna work uh in this session and let's see what is our first task on our first day at work so we're asked to add a feature to uh scooter microservice so we need to add live location to each scooter. And scooter uh, microservice has a database. And inside of uh, that database, it has a scooter's table. And basically, we want to save the live location of a scooter in this table. So let's say we have developed it, right? We're really good developers. We know how to do it. Uh, and now we want to test it. Uh, so the first thing that comes in mind is, hey, let's do unit tests. So 
First of all, let's understand what unit tests are. So basically, it means taking a unit. Uh, most of the time, it's actually a function or a procedure. Uh, and we're testing whether it's doing what is in what it is intended to do. Um, it allows us to test complex applications uh, comprehensively by adding uh, building blocks of tests and making them uh, more and more uh, comprehensive. Um, each test case uh, should be uh, tested independently to isolate the issues in, in order to identify where the issue came from. And we are using stubs and mocks in order to test each module uh, uh, in an isolation. The benefits that unit tests give us uh, is that they help us to find problems early in the development cycle, right? We just wrote the code. We will write a unit test and we will understand whether it works or not. It's before the deploying time. It's before it went to the client. It's really early in the process. And as we find problems earlier, uh, it costs uh, uh, less to fix them. Uh, if it went to a client, we may uh, lose the client. But if the client hasn't uh, even um, seen the feature and the bug wasn't um, 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 deployed to him, then he wouldn't be aware of it, right? So we wouldn't lose the client. And a client is worth of a lot of dollars or millions of dollars. Um, it makes it easier to, to trace the location of the failure. Uh, it provides some kind of um, living documentation of the system because we're updating the unit tests all the time. So it develops as the software is developing. Um, and it ensures that modules would, would still work after some kind of a refactor or some kind of an upgrade on a later, on a later date. Um, there are a lot of frameworks of, of uh, testing for Node.js. Uh, these four that I've mentioned, uh, Jest, Mocha, Jasmine, and Chai, are the most used ones and the most uh, common ones. Uh, the one I'm using today in the talk is Jest. We're going to see some kind of um, uh, some of um, uh, the examples are uh, in Jest, but uh, you, I really encourage you to go ahead and uh, go online and check what works for you. Um, so. Remember, we were hired uh, in the Scooter MS uh, team. We want to add the live location to the scooters table in Scooter MS. Um, so, and we want to test it, right? We've done it. Now we want to. Uh, now we want to test it using uh, unit tests. So here is an example for a test uh, written with Jest. And basically, this test is checking um, that I can update live location of an available scooter. So what I'm doing is first I am creating a scooter. Then I'm updating the location, I'm updating the latitude and longitude. Um, and then I am finding the scooter to make sure that the um, that what whatever I have in the database is the is the is the long, longitude and latitude that I expect it to be. Um, and as you can see, all the queries I have done here is queries to the database. I am actually querying the database. And like that test, I have a lot of other tests um, that are also, sorry, um, querying the database. So, one month later, um, we the system is growing. Um, the company is doing really good. And we have a lot of scooters and we have a lot of drivers. And we're updating the location uh, a lot. And we're getting the location a lot. Um, and we get into the understanding that we don't want to um, save it to the database anymore, the live location of the scooter. We want to shift it to Redis. 
Uh, but what would happen to our unit tests? Remember all our unit tests were querying the database. Now we are going to change the implementation uh, to use Redis. The API is different. Uh, so we need to, in, in the good case scenario, we need to adjust our tests. In the best case, in the in the worst case scenario, we, we we will need to remove tests altogether and write new ones. So you can understand that um, it's a very um, uh, tedious um, uh, process. You need to always maintain your unit tests, and uh, for um, really early stage uh, startup or even in a big company, uh, when you're writing new features and those features are evolving with time and implementation details are being changed, um, you will need to go ahead and change all your unit tests all over again. Um, and your time is money, so you don't want to do it all the time. So what if we wrote you API tests from the beginning? So what are API tests? So basically, it you can look at it as the same as unit tests, um, but on the API level. The, the, the unit that you're testing is the API, uh, the API level of your service. And you're testing the API to determine whether um, um, it works on, uh, on, with, with uh, good parameters and whether it uh, it does its work when when it gets bad parameters. That it works as intended with failures. Um, the uh, the API tests are business logic oriented, and as unit tests, um, we are um, testing each test case independently to isolate issues, and we're using here also stubs and mocks to isolate um, modules. Um, the benefit, again, because it's really um, um, close to unit tests, again, it helps us finding problems early in the de development uh, cycle. It's before deploying it. It's before pushing it even to, ma to master. Um, it provides uh, also a living documentation. Here it's for your APIs, not for your internal functions. Um, and uh, it, it also ensures that modules still work or, or APIs. You're not breaking APIs um, when you're refactoring or updating your code. Um, but the one thing that it's different from unit tests, the main, the main differentiator is, uh, here is that it is tolerant to underlying implementation changes. It doesn't matter how you implement inner functions, your API stays the same. So you can test your API and change every day your underlying implementation. The API test would stay the same. Um, so here is some kind of uh, comparison because between API tests and unit tests. So in the API test, as we said, it's on the API level. Um, it, we need fewer tests because we're testing a smaller set of functions, basically. Um, it is business logic oriented and it is tolerant to implementation changes. Uh, the unit tests are on the function level and the benefit that they have uh, is that it's more easier to lo locate the, the root cause of the failure with unit tests because you're testing the inner function. Um, so basically, the question is, which one should I use uh, in my system? Should I use unit tests? Should I use API tests? I say use both. Um, cover the APIs really in a really good way with API tests. Test your APIs um, really, really good. And also add unit tests to critical functions in your code that you really want to ensure that they work uh, in a good way. Um, okay, so 
let's see how API tests would look in the food deli delivery app. So we wanted to change, again, the implementation of live locations and change it from database uh, to move it to from the database to Redis. So here, again, it's the same test, but instead of querying the database, I am doing API requests. So I'm uh, creating a scooter with a post request. I am updating the, the, the latitude and longitude of it uh, with the patch request. And I am getting uh, the scooter to make sure that the latitude and longitude are as expected. And as you can see, these are API requests. Uh, there are on the API level. I have no consideration whether I'm using Redis or I'm using some kind of a database. It doesn't really matter. Um, the underlying implementation is transparent on the API level. And if we wrote all of, all of our tests uh, in this uh, approach from the beginning, uh, we didn't have to change all our tests because they were in the API level and we wouldn't have to do a double work. OK, so one month later, two months, uh, we're uh, two months in, in, in our job. Um, we want to change the live locations implementation again. Um, this is how it is in startup life. It's always uh, evolving and changing. Um, we want to move the live location of the scooter to a different microservice altogether. It's not going to be in the scooter microservice that our team is working on. A different team is going to be established. Uh, it's a scooter live location microservice uh, team. It's a different uh, microservice altogether. And we in the scooter MS are consuming uh, the live location um from scooter live location ms so the scooter live location microservice is exposing an api to um initialize live location of scooter with with some uh, specific uh, state um and in order to consume the this api we need to specify the latitude and longitude in the body of the request and we need to specify the state of the scooter in the query string of the request. Um, and as I said, our team in Scooter MS is consuming this API. So let's jump into it and see how. Um, so let's say, um, uh, yeah, so this is uh, the implementation of. Um, um, of updating, um, yes, of updating the um, the the location of the scooter through scooter live location uh, MS. I'm using here the network and I'm patching. Um, but as you can see, I am sending the state in the body and not in the query string. This is a bug in my code. At the time when I wrote this code, I didn't know I have a bug. So let's say I leave the bug there. I'm not uh, doing it correctly, but I have a bug in my code. We're human. It can happen, right? Um, and now I'm writing the test for my code. My code has a bug. So now I'm writing the test. And the test um, is basically I'm knocking. I'm doing here is a mock to the live location MS. Uh, so I'm knocking it uh, and I'm moving the state again in the body of the request. Uh, so this entire test would pass. Uh, but in real life, in reality, um, the scooter live location is expecting the state to be in the query string. So the test would pass in Scooter MS. In Scooter MS, when I'm writing the test to consume the API of Scooter Live Location, the, the test is passing, but I still have the bug and my test haven't revealed the bug. 
because um, the interaction um, between scooter MS and scooter live location MS was wrong. My code was wrong. So the test hasn't revealed the bug. Um, I am pushing to production a buggy code and in production, I will have a problem. These two services will not know how to communicate with each other because they're talking in different uh, languages, I would say. So that's why we need integration tests. Um, so integration tests are there to basically reveal problems in the integration or in the, inter in the interaction between microservices. Um, so we are basically in uh, integration tests, we're basically testing um, whether a combination of microservices perform some kind of a business logic in a good way um, in order to test um, uh, or, or to integration test our microservices, the, the combination of microservices that is tested are being brought up with their dependencies um, and there are, they are business flow oriented. So the benefits that, that uh, integration tests give us, uh, again, it's some kind of a, of, 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 a, of a living uh, documentation of our business flows. Um, it also ensures that we don't have regressions, that um, the interactions uh, or the business flows are still working after some kind of a refactor or an update or a code change. But the main differentiator here is that we're exposing faults in the uh, interaction between the integrated uh, units. The concerns we have here is that they take more time to set up and run. Um, they make it harder to locate the root cause of the fault. Um, they have higher costs due to uh, the setup of the environment and writing them is more complex and more time consuming. They take more time. So some kind of a recipe for uh, writing integration tests would be identifying your business flows in your system, uh, implementing those integration tests, and um, those, those, those uh, tests should check the system's state at the end of the flow, and also maybe uh, in the middle. Um, and as part of your CI-CD process, uh, you should set up the microservices that are being touched in this uh, test. You should run the tests on those microservices that you've set up. And you should run those tests on every code change uh, of those uh, microservices and their dependencies. So a testing process would roughly be something like uh, while you're developing, uh, you should run locally. It should give you a really fast feedback. Um, you should run locally the, your um, unit tests for those crucial uh, or critical functions that you have, the comprehensive API tests. And then on your uh, CI CD process, on every push, you should uh, run also your unit tests, your API tests, and on top of them, your integration tests uh, that involve the touched microservices. So um, what about after releasing to production, right? We've talked uh, up till now about what happens before releasing to production. Um, what, what should we do after releasing to production? Should we do anything? So I say yes, this is my tip. Uh, post-production testing, it's a thing. Um, it's where the world is going towards to. Um, and basically it means that you are testing. Yes. Time is going over. Uh, you still have a few minutes to, to complete. Yeah. Okay. We'll forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, so it means basically to, um, to test your production environment. Um, but 
why should we test our production environment? So basically, um, we should understand that we cannot test everything, right? Uh, if you shipped code to production or to a client, you know that uh, someday they, they call up to you and they tell you, hey, I have a bug. So you cannot troubleshoot all your bugs in advance. Um, also, the testing or staging environment that you have been setting up is never identical to your production environment, right? It's like comparing a zoo to nature. It's completely different. Um, it can uh, the traffic load can be um, um, uh, different. It has real users now, real user requests. The latency. Um, uh, with the production databases can be uh, bigger. Um, and you're using stubs in your testing environments. It's not reality. So you should use post-production testing um, as a complementary solution to your pre-production testing as your unit tests, API tests, and integration tests. You should also use post-production testing um so some of the best practices or common practices with testing production so we have canary testing basically it means uh deploying your new code to a small subset of uh, production machines um if you have a few instances of your microservice only push your new code to one of them uh, and only a few of your requests are going to go there. Um, another another uh, practice is controlled test flight. Uh, basically, it's really close to canary testing, but instead of redirecting some of your requests to a new machine, it means to directing a group of users to your new functionality and see if it behaves as expected. And both canary testing and control test flight has an issue that if you have a small amount of requests or a small amount of users in your uh, system, uh, it won't give you a lot of information. Um, so for that, if you have a small amount of users or a small amount of requests, I would use synthetic user testing it means that you are creating fake users or fake um, uh, fake uh, um, 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 entities in your system, and you are performing some kind of uh, scripts of of uh, behavior, um, and it executes uh, business flows in your production environment with fake users. But these are um, more closer to reality because it's the production environment and these are closer to real requests that you would have in your production environment and the last practice i want to talk to you about is fault injection Two minutes left yes um so the last uh, practice would be fault injection um you're basically creating problems in your production environment you're taking off services you're uh, sending bad requests, and you want to see how gracefully your entire ecosystem is uh, handling it. Uh, you might have uh, heard of it. Uh, Netflix is using it. It has a chaos monkey routine that creates chaos in the environment. Uh, so to sum up, um, we would want to use the best of all the worlds in uh in terms of testing our system we want to spend uh the least that we can in order to achieve the maximum that we can um so as we said uh use unit tests for your critical functions uh comprehensively uh test your apis use integration tests they are really really important in order to test the interaction of the services and don't forget to test in production um yes so if you have any questions you can send them to my uh email uh or to my uh, linkedin account um and that's it
this was uh, me. Thank That's you. That's great. Thank you, Karin. That was amazing. You've got a lot of warm feedback there in the in the web chat. If you'll be able to read that, it would be just perfect. So, how are you? Are you excited? How's your experience? Um, my experience was really great. Um, I really, I really loved it. Didn't you feel like a little bit alone while you're just talking to the webcam, but you don't see uh, you don't see people there? You know, you don't yeah, see I couldn't people. see. I couldn't see reactions, um, mm -hmm. and I couldn't see the the adrenaline wasn't there because when yeah. I perform perform when I talk uh, yeah, when when I talk in front of audience, uh, you have that adrenaline uh, inside yeah, of it. you, and uh, now you don't have that as much. Um, but um, it's the same. Uh, it's the same talk. It's only That's the personal perfect. feeling. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. That's why we use moderators. And uh, there's a few more practices that we'll try to introduce in the future, like make it a little, transform it into a little bit more talk show. So just to give you some reactions on the background. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karin. That was thank amazing. You. Unfortunately, Karin cannot attend, um, cannot attend our session, our Q&A session, because she's got actually to work tomorrow. So uh, that's the case. Some people, yeah, some people work more, some people, um, have the different schedules. We are going to have now a short break.